I'm Dr. Ellen Antoine. I'm the owner and medical director of Vine Healthcare, an integrative functional medicine practice in downtown Carmel. I'm sorry I'm not tall enough to kind of see everybody over here, so I'll kind of try my best to look around. Um, today we're going to be talking about the detrimental effects that gluten has on our organs that produce hormones and their effect on our well-being. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about my story. I'm a board-certified emergency medicine physician. I practiced in the emergency department for 12 years and absolutely loved being an ER doctor. In 2004, my husband was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor. I was pregnant with my fifth child, so I stopped working in the emergency department and decided to stay home with him. Praise God, my husband is fine. He actually is a physician that works in our practice today. And his health, I cannot claim functional medicine is what healed him. It was truly a miracle, um, but he's doing wonderfully. Around the same time, I was actually diagnosed with all the markers of lupus, which is an autoimmune condition where your body attacks itself. I now have five children, I, um, four of which are boys. My oldest, we were told, was on the spectrum for autism. I had twins with different learning disabilities being pulled out of class for speech therapy, occupational therapy, and specialized tutoring. I had a fourth that was diagnosed with severe ADD, and then my fifth was too little to have any diagnosis yet. But because we were all so sick, oh, and my husband was then diagnosed with epilepsy as a result of his brain tumor. And because we were all so ill, I, I felt like there's something wrong with what we're doing. We were healthy. Um, and we were doing all the right things, but traditional medicine was telling us all we needed to be on medication. So that was what really prompted me to go investigate integrative functional medicine, um, and I started learning about it and started implementing the things I was learning. We became gluten-free, ultimately dairy-free, I'm now grain-free, um, but because of the things that I saw in my own family, friends and family started asking me to help them. I ultimately became board certified in integrative holistic medicine and the first class of practitioners certified by the Institute for Functional Medicine. Um, when I saw these changes, I will tell you that personally I have no autoimmune antibodies, no evidence of lupus. My husband has not had a seizure in 11 years. My oldest is a junior in high school. Nobody would ever say he's on the spectrum for autism. My twins are pretty much straight A students with no tutoring, no specialized help at all. My fourth is definitely still an active learner. He does not require medication to get through seven hours of school. A trampoline at home works perfectly fine for his overactivity, but he's able to sit still through class. And like I said, because of that, friends and family started asking me to take care of them. And that's really what started me on my journey towards becoming this physician. I ultimately opened a very small practice and now have a much larger practice. We've seen over 800 patients and we enjoy what we do every day. So people ask me, what is functional integrative medicine? So I'd like to tell you my approach. I call it my 3F approach. It's my flower pot, my fire hose, and my flowing over. And I'm a really visual person, so I'm going to describe it this way. I look at the body like it's a flower pot. And at the bottom of a flower pot are holes. And if you take a watering can, you water your plant. The plant absorbs what it needs and drains out the bottom the excess. That's my really simplified analogy of what the body's supposed to do. We pour food and drink into our body. We have environmental things that pour into the body. We have spiritual stuff, social stuff, all sorts of stress stressors, emotional, everything like that. And unfortunately, most of us don't have a watering can. We have more of a fire hose pouring into the system. Our body is going to quickly get overwhelmed by the things that we're pouring in. And also, if you combine with that, the holes in the bottom of that flower pot, in my mind, represent our body's natural ability to detox. That's not a buzzword that you hear out there. We detox every day. We urinate, we have bowel movements, we sweat, we exhale. The liver goes through something called biotransformation. We have lymphatic drainage. And I consider when we sleep and dream a mental detox dump. If we don't do those things well genetically because we have small holes or those holes are filled with rocks and dirt from a lifestyle that's not been healthy and or we have a fire hose pouring into the system, as you can imagine, a flower pot is going to get quickly overwhelmed and we're going to end up with a puddle on the floor. 
That puddle, in my mind, represents symptoms of disease or true diagnoses. So we've got celiac disease, lupus, malignancies of any kind, diabetes, high blood pressure, or symptoms of disease. My stomach hurts. My joints hurt. I'm fatigued. I don't feel well. Traditional medicine, we're trained to mop up the floor. We're trained to take care of those symptoms or diseases. And I'll tell you what, it works really well in the emergency department. If you come in and you're having a heart attack, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you survive that heart attack. I don't really care why you have the heart attack. I don't really care that you're only 30 years old and you just ate a really bad meal. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to mop up the floor. Same thing with infection. I don't care that you've had 35 infections in the last 35 days. I just want to make sure you don't die from your infection, so I'm going to give you antibiotics. So we do that with high blood pressure and diabetes. We give you all sorts of medications, but we really don't spend a lot of time, time trying to identify how we got there. Functional medicine, my approach is three-pronged. I do mop up the floor when I have to, meaning I am still a doctor. I treat diseases, I treat diagnoses, but I don't do that anymore in isolation without trying to identify why we got there in the first place. The other thing that I'd like to do is optimize your body's ability to detox. If genetically you are not a good detoxifier, we need to theoretically carve out new holes to allow your body to detox. Or if you have normal sized detox pathways, those holes in the bottom of your flower pot, we need to make sure that we till the soil, if you will, and clean out those rocks and dirt and junk and allow your body to detox. And then we have to look at the, the fire hose. What are those things pouring into your life? It's obvious when it's obvious. If you smoke, you drink, you party, you eat McDonald's for every meal, you really don't need me to tell your lifestyle is unhealthy. You know that already. But it's, it's when you don't know you have a gluten sensitivity or you have um, you know, some true food allergy or something else in your environment is making you sick. So my job is to play detective and educate my patients about what's pouring into their life that's negatively impacting their health. So balance is the key to life. This is true in everything, and this is particularly true when we're talking about hormones. So gluten is not the only thing that impacts our hormonal health. That's what I'm focusing on today. But all of those um, environmental factors, we've got stress, you've got excess fat on your body impacts your hormones. You've got inflammation, nutritional deficiencies. As we get older, genetic dis predispositions, certainly the food, certainly our diet, all lead to hormonal dysfunction. So that's the fire hose that's pouring into the body. And then the signs and symptoms are really the overflow, that puddle on the floor. many organs in our body that produce hormones, and I'm only going to be really spending time talking about the adrenals and cortisol, which is our stress hormone. I'll be talking about the sex hormones um, and the organs that produce them, ovaries and testes. I'll be talking about the thyroid, specifically hypothyroidism, pancreas, or diabetes, where insulin is produced. So as of yesterday, on the U.S. National Library of Medicine, or under PubMed, PubMed, if you Google it, you will find, if you type in the search bar, gluten and hormones, there are 405 articles written about how gluten impacts our hormonal health. That's actually about 85 more articles in about the last year when I last researched this. So gluten intolerance is actually associated with greater than 300 diseases and conditions, and most of them actually um, are a result of hormonal imbalance. So back to my analogy about that flower pot, that puddle on the floor that I was talking about, we see patients every day in our office that present with signs and symptoms. They don't always walk in with a diagnosis. So people will present with things like fatigue, and weight gain, and hot flashes, and hair loss. And I wrote on here the most common hormonal imbalances that are associated with each one of those things. So for fatigue, we always think about thyroid conditions. Cortisol levels can be very low when someone comes in and they're feeling fatigued. Insulin doesn't function properly. And you can kind of go on weight gain. Cortisol is a big uh, 
um, factor in weight gain, high levels of cortisol. And we'll go through the specifics of this, but I wanted to present with you or, or present to you the signs and symptoms of things that people present to our office, that puddle on the floor. So we've got fatigue, we've got weight gain, hot flashes, hair loss, sleep disturbances, headache, low libido, stiffness, acne, PMS, carbohydrate cravings, and infertility. All of these things can be traced back to hormone imbalances, and the reason I put them in here is actually all of them can be traced back to the impact that gluten has on those organs of production of those hormones. So over 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates says all, said all diseases begin in the gut. And while we probably can't say all diseases begin in the gut, because we certainly have genetic uh, factors that play a role here, there is a definite role that the gut takes and a you know, significant um, amount of the disease and symptoms that people walk into our office. They often end up with GI issues. And oftentimes people present to our office, they have no GI complaints whatsoever. But we find out through testing and different things that we do in our office that they have a very unhealthy GI tract. And the reason I presented this is because this is a vicious cycle. We, you know, intestinal permeability or leaky gut that people talk about leads to inflammation, but inflammation also leads to intestinal permeability. Inflammation leads to abnormal hormone imbalance, but hormone imbalance leads to inflammation. Abnormal hormone imbalance leads to immune dysregulation, and immune dysregulation then we de develop autoimmunity, like celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition. And for those of you that don't know, autoimmune conditions are conditions um, where the body is attacking itself. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. The reason I have these little red stop signs that say stress in them is because every time we have one of these processes, we have a stress response. And cortisol is our stress hormone. And so there's a big fact stress causes these disease, diseases or conditions, but these conditions also cause release of stress hormone. So there's this entire feedback loop and this communication constantly going on, this vicious cycle. We're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the GI tract so we have a basic understanding of what I'm talking about. The normal intestines is made up of enterocytes from mouth to anus. We have a lining of the GI tract. And I was fascinated. I don't think I ever learned this in medical school, or if I did, I didn't pay attention. Each layer in the GI tract is only one cell thick. So there's a blood supply to every layer of cells in your GI tract. And these enterocytes, or these cells in your GI tract, are held together by things called tight junctions. And on this picture, there are the, those, are those little black circles there. Each cell is tightly glued together. If not, if it's not glued together tightly, we have what's called leaky gut, or intestinal permeability. I like to refer to it sometimes to intestinal leprosy. And the reason I say this is the lining of our GI tract should be intact, just like our skin. It's a protective mechanism where the, just like the skin protects us from outside world, we keep inside world in, outside world out, but we're protected. If you have lots of holes or areas that are broken down on your skin, the outside world can get in and you get sick. That's why our immune system you know, if you scrape yourself, you'll notice a big red line around where you scrape yourself. That's actually your immune system coming in and saying, we're not going to let any foreign invaders get through this scratch or this sore on my arm. So if you have, you know, lots of holes in your GI tract, the outside world, which is, are the things that are in the lumen of your GI tract, feces, bacteria, toxins, um, yeast, food proteins, they now have access into our blood supply, because I told you there's blood supply below every single cell layer in your GI tract. So there are two key elements that keep that barrier. We've got to have the intestinal lining intact, and we also have immune function that needs to be intact. So as I told you, those cells are tightly glued together by tight junctions. Zonulin is actually something, a protein that is released that unglues those tight junctions. In people with celiac disease, in particular, but it happens in everybody, if you 
consume gluten, zonulin is released in everybody, but particularly more so in people with celiac disease, that leads to the ungluing of those um, tight junctions, and those cells become very uh, spread apart, and you, you get leaky gut in that case. In celiac disease, you actually slough the lining of the GI tract also. But gluten induces this protein in everybody, that leads to the unbinding or ungluing of those cells being tightly glued together. So a lot of people will come into my office, they don't have any obvious gluten sensitivity or known celiac disease, but I often tell people to avoid eating gluten because I don't want them to end up with intestinal permeability, which we know that gluten does induce. The other thing to be important is 70%, which is important, is your immune function. 70% of your entire body's immune system lines your GI tract. And the reason it does that is because it's the most likely place next to your skin that things are going to get in and cause a problem. So um, here's a picture of, this is really a picture of celiac disease. You've got your normal intestinal lining. Those are the villi and microvilli that should be like finger-like projections in the lining of your GI tract. When we have inflammation, specifically celiac disease, we actually damage the lining of the GI tract because those microvilli slough off, which ends up um, leading to people being unable to absorb nutrients, um, iron deficiency, other nutritional deficiencies, and one autoimmune disease begets another. So when you have one autoimmune disease, it's very likely that you may have a second now or more or develop others in the future. So um, the picture at the bottom really shows that unglued uh, intestinal permeability. And now, as I mentioned, direct access can happen between those unglued cells where toxins can get directly into the blood supply Food proteins can get into the blood supply, bacteria, parasites if you have them, yeast, and create an immune response. So specifically talking about gluten, if we're using gluten as the trigger, and there are lots of triggers for intestinal permeability, I don't want you to walk away thinking gluten's the only thing that can lead to a leaky gut. There's lots of things that can lead to a leaky gut. Stress can lead to a leaky gut. Bacteria, um, antibiotics, uh, different infections in your body, different foods in your body, food allergies. So there's a lot of different things. But specifically, gluten causes an inflammatory response in many people, which in induces the stress hormone cortisol. We end up ultimately end up with some immune dysregulation that ultimately leads to autoimmunity. The army guy on the bottom of that screen is, is, I told you I'm a visual person, I think of our immune system like an army, sitting there waiting, getting ready to fire if anything penetrates through that intestinal barrier. So this is just a little funny about what I think autoimmunity is in a nutshell. So a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of information, about 64% of the U.S. population is obese, and hormonal imbalance is at the root of most of that. 20 million people in this country have thyroid disease, and 7 to 8% of them are autoimmune, mostly women, which is Hashimoto's autoimmune. There is Graves disease as well, which we're not going to talk about. That's hyperthyroidism. And then 90% of the population in the United States will say they feel fatigued at some point or another. Again, hormone related. So what is gluten? Gluten is actually a complex protein made up of two different proteins, gliadin and glutenin. Gliadin is the one that really causes a problem with celiac disease and gluten sensitivity. Um, and that protein gliadin is found in wheat, it's found in rye, spelt, triticale, barley, um, and lots of other grains. About 30% of the northern European population is positive for the HLA-DQ8 gene. Um, these are genetic markers that we measure in our office. Just because you're genetically predisposed to having celiac disease does not mean you have celiac disease, but it does increase your risk over the general population. About one in 100 people have celiac disease, 
and 98 or 99 percent of those people do not even know they have it. Again, you don't always present with GI manifestations, which my husband, by the way, will be talking about tomorrow at 11:35. There'll be a lecture on manifestations other than GI manifestations in the gluten sensitive or celiac patient. And at least, I would say I see more than this, but I do see a skewed population of patients. At least six to nine percent of the population is known to be gluten sensitive. And this is just a little picture of what gluten looks like with these two proteins bound together. So we're going to be talking about the steroid hormones. And I find this really interesting. I wish I had my pointer, but hopefully if I come over here, I won't buzz. So we always hear about cholesterol being bad for us. We're always worried about our cholesterol being too high. But it's really important for you to understand that cholesterol is necessary for you to make hormones. This is the steroidogenic pathway. This is where all our stress hormones and all our sex hormones are made. You need good, healthy fats in your diet to make hormones. So just think of that. I'm not talking about animal fat that's not grass-fed animals or wild. I'm talking, and I'm not talking about processed foods with lots of oils. I'm talking about good, healthy fats in your diet. You need cholesterol in order to make your stress hormones and in order to make your sex hormones. So the low-fat diet that we were all told to eat in the 80s and 90s has really been shown to be a very unhealthy diet, significant raise in diabetes as well, because we've been all told to have a high-carb, low-fat diet. And that thinking has dramatically changed. When I talk about stress with my patients, we all think about emotional, mental stress. We all think about, oh, I was stressed out at work, I got in a fight with my spouse, and that's certainly a piece of it. Mental, emotional stress is real. But there are also dietary and lifestyle stressors, as well as pain and inflammation. And interestingly, your body doesn't differentiate between the different types of stress. If you fall down a flight of steps, or you get in a fight with your spouse, or you eat something bad for you, stress is stress is stress, and you release cortisol, your stress hormone. It doesn't say, well, I'm going to do this because I got in a fight, or I'm going to do this instead because I fell down the steps. So your body sees stress the same way. And that's important for you to understand because some people say they feel really at, at peace. They're very happy. They don't have a lot of stressors in their life, but their diet or their lifestyle or an under-the-surface inflammatory process is going on, and actually their body reads it as quite a bit of stress going on in terms of uh, production of stress hormone. So you heard me talk about cortisol. Cortisol is your stress hormone. It is your fight or flight hormone. If you can see in the corner, that's, I, I put a picture. It is your hormone that's released telling your body you're being chased by a tiger. That being said, cortisol is released 24 hours a day. You cannot survive without cortisol being produced. You'll die. So cortisol production is highest in the morning, comes down in the afternoon, and at bedtime when you're getting ready to sleep, it should be at its lowest. So it's got this diurnal pattern, high, then low. When you wake up again in the morning, high again. And that's a normal pattern. Most of us, unfortunately, we have that fire hose pouring into our life, and we're living with cortisol levels up here all day long, even if we feel like we're at peace and we're relaxed, but our bodies are not. So the good things that cortisol does when we're being chased by a tiger is it raises blood sugar so that our muscles can run and we can run away. Unfortunately, if we're not actually running from a tiger and we're not needing that extra blood sugar, we're going to end up with blood sugar abnormalities and potentially even develop type 2 diabetes. Um, it inhibits your brain from functioning in ways because quite frankly, if you're being chased from the tiger, you don't really need to think so much. You just need to get out of there. But unfortunately, high levels of cortisol are going to lead to things like brain fog and memory loss. It also leads to clotting mechanisms. So if you happen to get bit by the tiger, your body wants to make sure you don't bleed to death. So you actually increase those blotting, clotting capabilities in the body, which then predispose you long-term to heart attack and stroke. It also causes some immune suppression, which in the short term is fine. Sodium conservation 
in the short term is fine. However, we don't want to be all puffy and full of extra fluid in our bodies on a long-term basis. You're going to use extra protein for energy. But what that does long-term is it starts breaking down muscles in your body. So you actually lose muscle mass. You're going to have an increased need for calcium. You're going to start pulling calcium out of your bones. So long-term stress, long-term uh, cortisol production is ultimately going to lead to increased risk of osteoporosis. So those prolonged elevations of cortisol, as I mentioned, are going to lead to increased fat deposition. So people will start typically developing fat around their center, fat around their internal organs. We're going to have increased blood pressure from that salt retention. You're going to lose muscle mass, as I mentioned, develop possibly osteoporosis or at least osteopenia. You're going to suppress the immune system, have memory loss, depression, and uh, possibly even develop type 2 diabetes, and be at increased risk of developing those blood clots, stroke, heart attack, etc. After long periods of cortisol levels being high, 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 the body can't keep up with that demand over a long time, so we get cortisol de depletion, and that leads to symptoms such as listed here, depression, postpartum depression, severe fatigue, so people might present with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia or muscle pains, blood pressure abnormalities, inflammation, allergies, increased risk for infections and even cancer, and early onset menopause and andropause. And the reason I say cancer is because if your body's chronically stressed, at any one point in time, we all have cancer cells in our bodies, and our immune system and our body should recognize those cells as abnormal, and we go through a process called um, apoptosis. If your body's busy all the time trying to deal with other things, or if your immune system is so depressed at this point, you're not going to recognize those cells, and you do have an increased risk of developing cancer. And this is the different faces, I would say, of adrenal fatigue and exhaustion. And we're going to go through the specifics of what that looks like. In our office, we do lots of ways, there are lots of ways to measure hormones. One of the ways that we measure in our office is a four-point salivary hormone test. So we um, ask patients to collect saliva four times during the day, early morning, afternoon, dinner time, and bedtime. This is a normal adrenal profile. Um, you should be, as I told you, earliest in, the, in, I mean, highest in the morning. At about lunchtime, it falls. Falls a little bit lower at dinner time, and then at its lowest at bedtime. So you should be in this green. Um, you could be outside of it a little bit in the yellow, but ideally, this is what an ideal salivary panel looks like. Stage one adrenal fatigue is this alarm phase. And I put this picture of this cartoon woman putting on her lipsticks because most people don't know. I would say I probably live here most of the time. I have five kids. I own my own medical practice. I'm running, running, running all the time. And this is what you typically are. Your cortisol levels, while they're in normal range, they're still in the yellow here. They're not in the red for most of the day. You hit bedtime, and that's when I have to pull out my laptop and get on my computer and get all my work done because I finally put all the kids to bed. So it's not unusual for people in stage one adrenal fatigue to not necessarily feel bad. They feel like they can go, go, go till they can't go anymore. Sometimes they might notice they have insomnia and feel like they can't sleep at night. Stage two adrenal fatigue is wired but tired or crabby. So you've got a mix between some low and some high points of, of saliva testing. When you go from one stage to another, it could be years, could be months, could be weeks. Everybody's body is a little bit different. But as you continue with that fire hose pouring into the body and you're chronically stressed, your body has to respond. And the adrenals cannot always keep up with that demand. So at some point, you are going to hit a wall and you're going to start to notice the effects. This is that person who, you know, is irritable and feels tired all the time. 
stage three adrenal fatigue is exhaustion. And we have a lot of patients that come into our office and just feel like they cannot function. They can't get up in the morning. They can't get through their day. And this is what their salivary panel looks like. They really can't manifest any cortisol production. And this sometimes requires that we actually give those patients some steroids. Because as I told you, cortisol is necessary for life. You'll die without it. And cortisol is a steroid hormone, so small doses of steroids may be necessary if your adrenals aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is what stages of adrenal fatigue would look like. I put a woman, a woman on her, you, men, you'll see yourself on here in a minute. Um, but we start to, as I told you, cortisol, um, as we stress, stress, stress all the time, start putting on that excess body fat, middle of the body here, okay? So as we go through adrenal fatigue stages, tend to gain more weight and feel not great, lose muscle mass through the body. So a lot of people that come in, they haven't changed their diet. They feel exhausted, but their body size and shape has changed significantly. So I think this is funny. It says, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, an executive, a cook, a housekeeper, a teacher, a chauffeur, and a soccer coach. That's only 19 pounds per woman. So now we're going to talk a little bit about cortisol steel. I showed you this um, steroidogenic pathway. Cholesterol makes cortisol, but it also splits and makes your sex hormones. I describe this to my patients like two bank accounts. Cortisol, I told you, is necessary for life. This is your bank account that you have to live off of. You can't survive without any money. You won't be able to feed yourself. You won't have any place to live. Your sex hormones, men and women can both live without their testicles or their ovaries. You may want to die, but you're not going to die. Um, so that's your bank account, that's your play money account. And what ends up happening is when the demand for cortisol is high, the body steals from the play money bank account and says we have to put money in the real bank account or we're going to die. So you end up decreasing your production of your sex hormones. And I've had women who've had a parent die or a spouse or a child or some tragic event in their life. They're 30 years old, 35 years old, and they go into instant menopause because they've had this major stressor. And maybe they were chronically stressed, and then they had this life-altering event. And we automatically shut off production of uh, making those stress hormones because the demand for cortisol is so high. So the signs of too little estrogen, or what would be described as cortisol steal, we're stealing that money from that bank account, we're going to have irritability, nervousness, um, hair loss, body size changes, difficulty sleeping, vaginal dryness, some sexual abnormalities, dry skin, fatigue, people will have perimenopause type symptoms, um, sweats and hot flashes, those types of things. Brain fog is a big one. I have lots of women who come into my office and they say, I just don't feel like I'm as vital as I was. My brain's not working. I'm afraid. Am I, do I have Alzheimer's? Often these are hormonal abnormalities. Signs of too little testosterone, so loss of muscle mass, which is important. Testosterone is very important for us to have good muscle mass. Decreased sex drive insulin resistance, diabetes. In men, the testicles can actually shrink. People will develop weight gain also, irritability, fatigue as well, hair loss, or actually can develop hair in places you don't really want it for women in particular, and men on the back, um, depression and male infertility. So it's a pretty similar picture for men. Men start to, as they have issues with hormones as well, start to gain weight around their middle area. People will joke and say that as a woman ages, she starts to look more like a man. She gets facial hair, she gets more fat around the middle, um, and, and some baldness. And then men, they'll say, will look more like women, and they start to get fat around the middle and breasts, and it's kind of funny. But both people will start to gain more around that middle area, which is not good, and it does increase your risk of cardiovascular disease to have that fat around those middle and organ areas. So we're going to talk a little bit now about hypothyroidism. 
About 20 million Americans have some form of thyroid disease. 60% of those people with thyroid disease are unaware, and 90% of them actually have an autoimmune condition. Hashimoto's is the most common autoimmune disease in the United States, and that is a disease where the body's attacking the thyroid and we actually underproduce thyroid hormone. About seven to eight percent of the population has this autoimmune condition. One in eight women will develop some form of thyroid disease in her lifetime. So it's a huge number, and I will tell you, I see at least that in my practice. Synthroid, which is a commercially prescribed thyroid uh, medication, it's T4, is one of the most commonly prescribed medications in the United States. The other important thing is we can't live without thyroid hormone I either. So every single cell in the body has a receptor on its cell wall, on its cell membrane, for thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone is very important for every single function in the body. And thyroid is what gives you energy. It's what makes your body function. So the symptoms of hypothyroidism, fatigue, hair loss, thinning of your lateral parts of your eyebrows, um, often cold intolerance or feeling like your hands and feet are cold all the time, muscle stiffness, fluid retention, feelings of being depressed, um, menstrual irregularities, infertility is a common one, and decreased body temp. A lot of people will monitor their body temperatures and notice that they're constantly on the lower side. So what is that gluten thyroid connection? Gliadin is that one of those proteins in gluten that I told you that actually the DNA that's in gliadin looks an awful lot like the DNA found in your thyroid gland. It actually looks a lot like the DNA found in your thyroid gland as well as your pancreas as well as your joints. So when you have intestinal permeability, and you've got your army guys down there, but you've got intestinal permeability, those proteins get into your bloodstream, they activate those army guys who say, hey, I don't like this. It, it recognizes gluten or gliadin, that protein, as abnormal, and it scours your body to make sure nothing escaped and got past it. So now we're looking for what we think is gluten, and we identify the thyroid, we identify the pancreas, and we identify the joints often as those abnormal foreign invaders that got through. So we end up with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, type 1 diabetes that we'll talk about, and I'm not talking about it here, but rheumatoid arthritis is also associated with, there's a strong association with gluten. So stress, all those types of stress I told you about, tells your brain to tell your body to make more cortisol, but it also tells your body to make more thyroid hormone. Unfortunately, high levels of cortisol tell your body to stop making thyroid hormone. And high levels of cortisol also tell your body, the, the brain tells your thyroid, make, the brain tells your thyroid through TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, make T4. T4 is a hormone that then has to travel out to your body and be converted to T3, which is the active form in your body. That's the form your body's looking for, is that T3. Cortisol actually prevents that conversion of T4 to T3. So under chronic stress, even though you may be making T4, you may not be able to convert it to the form that your body actually utilizes. There are also nutritional regulators of thyroid hormone. If you have celiac disease, if you have a leaky gut, you're not going to be absorbing the nutrients your body requires. Your body requires zinc, selenium, magnesium, B vitamins, iron, all sorts of things and protein in order to make thyroid hormone and then convert thyroid hormone from T4 to T3. So if you've got a leaky gut and nutritional abnormalities as a result of that, that's another reason you can have thyroid hormone abnormalities. This is just a picture of all the, all the organs that can be involved in autoimmune diseases, or the most common ones, I should say, of autoimmune diseases. So your brain can be impacted, thyroid, bone, liver, heart, pancreas, gut, joint, testes, and ovaries. And I told you, one autoimmune disease begets another. Very common, if you have one, you're likely at some point going to develop another, unless you take care of it and turn that autoimmune kind of signal off in your body. 
So now we're going to talk a little bit about pancreas and insulin and um, type 1 diabetes. So when we eat food, food in the body, um, you know, gets converted into glucose. It gives that signal to the pancreas, which sits kind of below and behind the stomach, if you will, to stimulate it to make insulin. Insulin is what takes blood sugar, the sugar in your blood, and allows it to be driven into the cells to be utilized. In autoimmune disease, we actually attack the pancreas and a particular part of the pancreas, and we are unable to make insulin. So there's a difference between type 1 diabetes, which is autoimmune in nature, and type 2 diabetes that I'll talk about in a minute. Eight percent of type 1 diabetics have associated celiac disease. So there's a very strong connection there. Insulin resistance is what really happens as the precursor to type 2 diabetes. So this is different. This is not autoimmune in nature. We are still able to make insulin in the pancreas, but the cells have insulin receptors, and they're no longer um, hearing that signal. Those receptors become somewhat deaf to the insulin itself, and they're not able to allow glucose into the cells, so glucose remains in your bloodstream. That's why blood sugar is high. So you have these malfunctioning insulin receptors as a result of inflammation, immune issues, obesity, there is some genetic piece to it, and a sedentary lifestyle. So did you know that two slices of multigrain bread actually increases your blood sugar as much as six spoonfuls of sugar. So we all think we're doing a great job. I thought I was healthy when I was eating my whole grain wheat bread sandwiches. Um, but, and I don't have celiac disease, but as I told you, all those precursors for lupus, I did. Um, but just to be aware of what you're doing when you eat healthy foods out there. Okay, so this just made me laugh. Sorry, I hope you can all see it. But So maybe it wasn't such a good idea to buy estrogen pills off the internet after all. And see this big, hairy monster. So what do we need to do now? Well, first and form foremost, we have to remove stress. We've got to work on the emotional mental piece, diet and lifestyle piece, pain and inflammation piece that I talked about. So I recommend you remove gluten because it leads to intestinal permeability, which is a stressor, and you're going to be on that vicious cycle. Remove other irritants. Um, there's great products out here for skin care or cleaning. Go on environmentalworkinggroup.org and look at things that you should be doing to clean your home or skin care products that you should be using on your body. I tell my patients, if you're not willing to eat it, you sh it shouldn't go on your body. Um, other things that can lead to inflammatory condition and GI uh, disturbances are allergens, toxins, other stressors in your life. So we've got to actually heal the lining of the GI tract. And we'll talk a little about, about the 6R protocol that I recommend my patients take. But you've got to do some things to actually heal the lining of the GI tract. You have to eat the right foods. When you have hormonal imbalances, there's some foods that are better than others to eat. So certain sex hormones, you want to eat more cruciferous vegetables. People will talk to me all the time about cruciferous like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts as being an issue if you have thyroid disease. You have to eat massive quantities of those things in order to really have a negative impact on your thyroid from my experience. Um, but they are very good at helping balance some sex hormones. You need those nutrients in order to make thyroid hormone that we talked about. Um, Adaptogenic herbs are herbs that help your body. If your cortisol levels are too low, they adapt and bring those cortisol levels up. If your body is too high in cortisol, obviously you need to reduce the stressors. But what can we do in the meantime? It takes a long time to normalize. You can take adaptogenic herbs to help bring you down to a normal level as well. And then you want to replace certain hormone deficiencies. Sometimes we need to give people steroids. Sometimes we need to give people thyroid hormone. Sometimes we need to give people vitamin D, which actually is not a vitamin. It actually is a hormone. Um, 
Um, and I would highly rec recommend that you all get your vitamin D levels checked. The literature actually supports a vitamin D level at a minimum of 40, but ideally 60 to 80. Vitamin D is sort of like a shoelace that helps tie those enterocytes, those cells in your GI tract together and keep them tightly bound. So vitamin D is associated with 20 to 40 different diseases, particularly when it's low. So again, ideally 60 to 80, not the 30 to 100 that the reference range tells you at the lab. So I go through a 6R gut healing program for all of my patients. Remove, replace, restore, re-inoculate, balance, and rotate. So you've got to remove, as we talked about, certain foods. You may have to remove medications in your life, like chronic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, pesticides, bad bugs in your GI tract. You might have yeast overgrowth or abnormal bacteria or even parasites in there. So what do you need to remove in your life? Um, and I'd like you all to kind of think about that. What do you need to replace? Often in my office, we test for nutritional deficiencies. So we need to replace those things. But what do you need to replace perhaps in your diet with what you're currently eating? Um, what about digestive enzymes? What about hydrochloric acid? What about fiber? These are all things to be thinking about to put into your diet. Re-inoculate. We are actually made up of, uh, we are outnumbered, I should say, 10 to 1 by the number of organisms that live in our GI tract to the number of the cells in the whole body. We have over 100 trillion organisms in the GI tract. There's over 1,000 different species of organisms in the GI tract. We only have 10 trillion cells in the whole body. So if you think about it, we are more bug than human, and we need to keep those bugs in check. I think of it like a scary Alfred Hitchcock movie. I don't really want the bugs taking over, so I'm going to keep them in balance the way I want them to be. So probiotics are a great, great way to do that. Also, lacto-fermented foods, things that are naturally fermented, not with vinegar, but are fermented in themselves in salt water, things like sour kimchi, certain pickles. So read your labels. Um, we want to repair or restore the lining of the GI tract. There's certain nutrients that do that. Vitamin D is very important for that process. Glutamine, which is an amino acid, is important. Omega-3 fats, which is an essential fatty acid. That word essential, just so you know, doesn't mean essential the way we think about it. Essential fatty acids, like fish oil, are called essential because the body doesn't make them. So you have to get them from diet. We want to rebalance. That's where the stress reduction comes into play. I'm working with my patients. I'm reducing pain and inflammation. We're changing their diet, looking at their lifestyle. You have to work on the emotional mental piece too. So you have to do things like prayer, meditation, yoga, taking a nice bath or a walk or whatever reduces that emotional mental stress in your life. Sometimes changing relationships, sometimes changing a job. It's an important piece to look at. And then the last thing I tell my patients is to rotate. We all get stuck in a rut. We go to the grocery store, we go to the same aisles, we buy the same food, we come home, we eat the same food, and we go back to the grocery store and we do the same thing. It's really important, especially when we have intestinal permeability, and every one of us has some degree of it. We don't want to present the same proteins over and over and over. We're going to upregulate that immune system. So it's really important. Don't be crazy about it, and I have some patients that are, like, oh, I ate chicken yesterday, I can't eat it again today. I'm talking about every day, day after day after day. You don't want to eat just this for breakfast and salad for lunch and chicken for dinner. Try to rotate the, around the things you eat on a regular basis. So ask yourself these questions. What can you do to add to vi variety into your diet? What do you need to modify your attitude and lifestyle? What do you need to support a healthy lining in your GI tract? What do you need to support or reestablish healthy bugs in your GI tract? What do you need to replace in your life, in your diet, in your nutrients, and what do you need to remove? I just, I want you to think about that. I don't want you to think about stress as only emotional, mental. I know I've said it a million times, but even when you feel good, your body might not feel good. So look at your lifestyle, look at your diet, get markers of inflammation looked at, which is an easy thing to do at your doctor's office. 
love this, and you guys probably can't read it. It says, what fits your, be what fits your busy schedule better, Ex exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? This was a really interesting study that was done. Um, it looked at 30,000 patients. They found that there was a 39% increased risk of death in those with celiac disease, increased risk by 35% risk of death in those with gluten sensitivity, but no celiac disease, and 72% increased risk of death in those with gut inflammation related to gluten. And that was in JAMA in 2009. I am done. If you guys have any questions, we are at booth 325, a couple rows over, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.